spotlight on the Normandy fighting has moved eastward. Here, southwest of Caen, the British have widened their bridgehead across the Odor River, and one of the decisive battles of the Normandy campaign is in the making. The ripening cornfields of western France are serving as the theater for this great armored clash. The whole pace of the war at the eastern end of the beachhead is growing in speed and intensity. It is here the enemy has massed his panzer forces. Rommel, the defeated Nazi from Africa and Sicily, has thrown the elements of seven armored divisions into the battle. But so far, these forces have been committed to the battle piecemeal, and he has nothing to show for his repeated counterattacks but dead tanks and dead defenders. Rommel is now face to face with his old desert foe, General Montgomery, and it's expected the Nazis' defeat in the desert will find its counterpart here in France. French villagers are being cared for in special camps. Lessons learned in the fall of France are being put to effective purpose. No roads are choked with refugees, and the British war machine is able to move forward unhindered. The swelling hordes of Nazi prisoners afford new proof of the growing vulnerability of Hitler's military machine. Youngsters 15 and 16 years of age are commonplace in this sector. Over the rich soil of Normandy, Montgomery's infantry probed new salience and consolidated its bridgehead. The wedge across the Odor River is posing an ever-increasing threat to the town of Caen. That rail and road junction is one of the most important enemy bastions in Normandy. It is being defended with determination. The Nazis have yielded ground only after severe struggles but their losses in tanks and casualties in manpower are mounting daily. The so-called flail tank, pictured here for the public for the first time, is clearing minefields with record speed. Its flying chains dig them out and explode them without harm to the tank or its personnel. Allied pressure in Normandy is gathering increasing force. This is a mighty task ahead, but it will be fulfilled. The Liberators have been trained and equipped magnificently. They pour onto the battlefield with confidence in their ability and in their cause. The speed with which the American army captured Cherbourg surprised even the most optimistic military observers. To the Nazis, the loss of this third largest port in France represents a tremendous defeat. During the first few hours, 20,000 prisoners fell into Allied hands. Here and there, a few women are discovered in pillboxes. Well over 40,000 Nazi prisoners have been taken in the Normandy fighting, and the count is far from complete. The defeat at Cherbourg is a shattering blow to Germany and her satellites. The Nazis have grown accustomed to defeat in Russia, but here is defeat in the West, where the enemy promised he was unassailable. And Cherbourg is only a harbinger of things to come. Its fall has shattered the last faint hope of a Nazi victory. The rapid American victory at Cherbourg was due in a large part to the splendid British support at the eastern end of the Normandy front. Sterling bombers dropped supplies to the 6th Airborne Division. These British airborne fighters have operated brilliantly. Often they attack behind the German lines, destroying vital Nazi defenses. Supplies are swept up and put to immediate use.
Equipment containers are rushed by jeeps to waiting units. American Air Force pictures reveal the devastating effect of United States bombings. Pill boxes, gun emplacements, and other concrete defenses were destroyed. Also destroyed was the Nazi dream of the fortified line. Here is evidence indeed of the irresistibility of combined air and ground operations. No fortified line anywhere. No army on earth could withstand the merciless explosive power the Allies are now able to turn on the enemy. The United States 9th Air Force immobilized many of Hitler's launching platforms for flying bombs. Southern England is thankful indeed that these sites fell to the Americans before they were put to use. One enormous installation has a main ramp 750 feet long and 70 feet wide. Reinforced concrete 50 feet thick would have required powerful Allied bombing attacks. It was not yet completed when the Germans were driven out. The Germans boasted that this giant launching platform was intended for flying bombs directed against America. Be that as it may, it is obvious the psychology of the United Nations is far beyond Nazi understanding. The German high command entertained the serious conviction that the flying bomb would force the Allies to pull their aerial punches. How ludicrous this conviction must seem to the Germans now as the Allied offensive on continental Europe gains momentum. Allied warships move into range of enemy fire and turn their big guns against the fortress batteries of Cherbourg. This was the final assault on the great transatlantic port. Cherbourg, General von Schlieben had ordered his men to resist to the death. Typically, these orders were issued from the safety of a dugout 30 feet below the ground. American infantry, man for man, were more than a match for the defenders as they fought their way forward street by street. One after the other, enemy strong points yielded surrendering Nazis. Hitler's military bullies in their hour of utter defeat. Von Schlieben, the Nazi commander, and Admiral Henneke, in command of naval defenses, came out of their deep shelter to save their Nazi neck. But the troops had been told to fight on hopelessly to the death. It was the privilege of Major General Collins of the United States Army to receive von Schlieben's capitulation, one of the most significant since the Allied Western Campaign began. In bringing this Nazi militarist and his troops to their knees, the Americans have won the commendation of the free world. Thus in defeat, the Nazi thousands are brought to Britain. This parade will continue till the unconditional surrender of Germany is completed. <laughs>